Welcome everybody to this LSE Ideas event where we are launching a really exciting new report called The Rise of Insurgent Europeanism. Uh, at a moment when everybody's feeling really a bit depressed about the current situation, I think uh, our findings that there is a move towards um, European pressure for European reform at the grassroots, whereas in the past the grassroots were usually mostly concerned with local issues, is, is a really quite significant shift in public opinion and the role of a European public sphere. So to tell you all about it, we've got a wonderful group of people. Uh, we have Rock, um, who is one of the main authors of the report, who will tell us the main conclusions of the report. We then have, I haven't given Rock's whole name because it's impossible to pronounce in English, but you can see it on the, uh, on the screen. We have Niccolò Milanese, who's also one of the authors of the report and is going to tell us about the main recommendations of the report. And then we have two wonderful representatives uh, of exactly what we're talking about. Uh, one is Mikhaila uh, Pobudova, who's a civil society activist from Slovakia. Um, and um, she's, uh, she's the director of a civil association which supports refugees called Marina, but no doubt she'll tell us more about it. And then we have Marika Kukuk, who is a politician from this new, wonderful, transnational European party um, in the European Parliament, but also in all sorts of places. And we just did very well in the Dutch elections. So it's very exciting. And she, in a way, personifies the new insurgent Europeanism. So it's great to be able to hear from her. And we're hoping, we have another speaker, Shalini Randira from the Institute for Human, Society, uh, Human Sciences in Vienna. She's got terribly caught up with something else and she may not be able to join us, but I've said to her, even if she can just join us at the end, we'd love to hear from her. So with that, I will turn over to Rock to start us off. We'll hear from everybody and then we'll have a general discussion. Um. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my slides, please? Is that yes. Okay? Yes, so my name is Roch Dunin von Savic, uh, and I'm one of the research officers at the um, uh, Visions of Europe program at uh, LSE Ideas. Um, and I wanted to uh, just describe a little bit in, in a little bit more detail the process through which we arrived at the vision of uh, the uh, Insurgent Europeanism report and some of its uh, main findings. Uh, and then I'll give uh, the floor to Nicolo, who will discuss the implications of the report for European politics and European democracy, as well as uh, for the upcoming conference for the future of Europe. So the report is a result of a two year study within LSE Ideas, within the Visions of Europe program. And it is inspired, as, as, as Mary mentioned, by, by the studies of subterranean politics that was carried out by some of the members of the team back in 2012. Um, and then again in 2016, at this critical juncture in, in European and world politics. And at both of those uh, junctures, um, the, the, the um, diagnosis of the European, of European civil society sphere was that Europe, that Europe or the EU was a non-issue, especially for grassroots civil society actors. They were not concerned with what was happening on the European political sphere. They were concerned with the here and now uh, and with their national spheres. Some of those who were pro-European, they took Europe for granted. Um, our 2018-2020 study, uh, uh, which really happened at the crescendo of, of a decade of crises that, that ravaged the, the continent, shows a shift in civil society's attitudes towards Europe. And it really reflects um, a, a new dynamic, uh, uh, what we call an emergence of a new visions of Europe, uh, on the basis of the of critical re-examination and re-engagement uh, with European politics uh, on various levels of, of European civil society. As I mentioned, all of this really informs the, the Conference of the Future of Europe, which hopefully 
will will be uh, launched on um, um, on uh, Sunday. Um, so um, the study, just just briefly. So the aim of the study was to identify and study transnational civil society. Um, so actors that operate on in the, with what we call the European civic space or seek change at the European level. We started with with the participants of the European Citizens Initiative, and we uh, snowballed thereafter. The the, the study comprises um, a detailed analysis of 167 actors scattered across Europe complemented by 30 in-depth interviews with civil society actors from um, uh, selected countries, countries that we uh, identified where um, political polarization had been heightened in, the, in previous years, but also countries that lay somewhat on the margins of Europe. So we are interested in the, in the, in the, in the outside look in, so to speak. That was then followed by, by, by a participant survey to triangulate the data. But we also, we also met civil society activists, that was pre-pandemic obviously, uh, during two international conferences, one in London, one in Palermo, which we call the moments of dialogue. So we had a pretty robust and, and varied methodology to arrive at the findings. Um, essentially, we, what we argue is that uh, this dynamic realignment of civil society on the issue of Europe fosters the emergence of of a, of, a, of, an emerge, of, of a European public sphere, something that has, has been long in the making and something that has been long yearned for by, by various politicians, pundits, or, or, or threatened by others. But Nicola will, will, will discuss uh, the, um, the parameters of that European public sphere in a little bit more detail. Uh, but what we do find is, however, that this dichotomy between being between for or against Europe uh, while it still exists to an extent, obviously, it loses its uh, uh, analytical utility when, when looking at civil society. We find that even right-wing populists do not want to leave or, or, or destroy the EU. They want to shape it in their own image. But particularly the more progressive, the more pro-European civil society activists that we found, that we have been studying, also have changed their attitudes towards Europe. So they're no longer Brussels-centric, for example. So being in Brussels is no longer a prerequisite for um, participating in the debates on the future of the European Union. So it, these are very much local issues that drive a lot of those actors, but then are also um, deliberated and addressed on a transnational scale. But I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail in, in the next, on the next slide. However, we do find that there are three ideal types of, uh, of civil society activists. Um, uh, and actors. So we have what we call tra traditional Europeanists. So those are people that are communicating the benefits of European integration that seek change at the institutional level. Some of them are federalists. So they are the tra traditional breed of civil society actors that deal with Europe and that are really well plugged into what the critics would call the, the Brussels bubble. Um, so those are the people who 10 years ago had also been interested in European affairs. They're still here and they still matter but they're definitely not the most interesting actors uh, that we can find or the ones that are really pushing the debate on Europe forward from the perspective of civil society. The arrival or the transformation of two types of other actors, uh, two other types of actors are, um, is, is what concerns us the most. So these are what we call instrumental Europeanists. So people who create pressure and momentum for the, um, for the for the European project, but from the perspective of um, of their own agendas, of their particular uh, goals that often um, relate to their immediate surroundings. So these are pragmatic Europeanists in the field of consumer rights, ecology, migration, transparency. So those are the people that maybe ten years ago thought that the only uh, points of contact for their policy agendas were national politicians or local politicians. And now they realize that uh, European policy making, European politics affects their day-to-day um, their -day business, but also that they can seek uh, and forge alliances across borders in order to further their goals. But they also are much more, um, uh, much more aware of uh, the fact that they share uh, uh, the, the 
the plight of, of other uh, actors across the continent. And that's particularly in result of the crises, as I said, that ravaged the continent. So, so uh, the financial crisis, the euro crisis, the migration crisis, the Brexit, and in, obviously most recently, the pandemic. So those instrumental Europeanists understand that even the small um, agendas that are very much locally um, spe lo specific to their localities should and have to be addressed from the European level. And then we have insurgent Europeanists. So those are the ones who create pressure and momentum for progressive change at the European level. These are social movements and campaigns, but also transnational European parties, such as, such as the, the one that we're hosting today, the member of one of those parties. And the, this is, this, these are very much new, a new type of, 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 um, of European um, civil society that really sees all politics in Europe as European. Uh, for whom those dis distinctions and divisions of the past uh, are no longer uh, valid and who, who really refuse to see uh, politics only through a national lens. Uh, another dimension of the report uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, are the visions of Europe that emerge. Oh, the one, well, sorry, one second that I forgot. So this is roughly the breakdown of, of, uh, between the types of actors that we found. Um, however, these categories are very much ideal types. So some actors may have some characteristics of both being instrumental or insurgent Europeanists. But this is just to give you a snapshot of what is the, what is the breakdown between those two, three different categories. So we see the traditional and, and instrumental Europeanists still um, very much comprise the majority of, of those actors. Um, but it also matters what civil society now wants to wants from Europe. Um, and the first want, the first division that is very articulated is for a normative Europe. Uh, so they do not want Europe to, no, they don't want it to any longer to be a scapegoat uh, to be used by national politicians for their failings. They don't want it to be an arena for intra-governmental bargaining. Uh, they want Europe to be guardian of values and norms when it comes to human rights, when it comes to democracy. They say that without norms, without values, the EU loses its uh, sui generis status. It's one of a kind quality. It just turns into a trading block. Um, they want to go beyond technocracy and this uh, sort of neo-functionalist character of European integration. So they say, that, so for them, that dimension of Europe is, is key. Uh, they also want a popular Europe. So while member states remain the primary actors of the European construction, especially legally, our respondents recognize that uh, the social reality of Europe cannot be reduced to, to the national logic anymore. So citizens, cities, regions should have greater participation in, in the decision-making process on the European level to make Europe more popular. They want a more bottom-up approach to governance. They want, uh, they're focused on localism. So sometimes some of the more specific and tangible requests are to cut out the middleman of the, of the, of the, of the, of the member state and create uh, more specific, uh, both uh, decision-making, but also funding structures that connect the European Union with the local uh, uh, level and the subnational level. Um, but I also mentioned that they very much subscribe to the EU's notion of subsidiarity. So uh, they don't want a totalizing European super state that will take over the prerogatives and responsibilities of every possible um, level of governance. Uh, the EU should only step in when it is absolutely necessary when, when, when when, it's, when those functions cannot be uh, taken up by other smaller uh, entities. And that takes us to the third type, the third vision of Europe that is put forward by civil society, which we call responsive Europe. And this is very much very firmly uh, articulated on the basis of the global threats and the global, the, the global crises that have affected the continent in the second decade of the 21st century, as I mentioned before, this overlapping cascade of crises, the financial crisis, the Europe, the Euro, Euro crisis, the migration crisis, the political crisis of, of European sovereignty uh, uh, surrounding Brexit, and now very much exacerbated by the pandemic. And we have to take into account that our, 
uh, some of our some of our research took place in, in early throughout 2020. So, so it, this is very much uh, a fresh take on on the changes to to the social fabric of Europe as articulated by by civil society activists. Um, and this is very much a realization that in national independence is. Uh, is is uh, is a uh, is a thing of the past of, of, of the the 19th if not the 20th century, um, and it's a civilizational realization. So that that migration, that climate, that human security, and increasingly health needs to be addressed by by the European Union or by some other structure of a united Europe, because na national states alone are incapable or unwilling, uh, or just not very good at doing it. And obviously. Uh, vaccine procurement with its um, shaky start, but ultimately gaining momentum has been a very good example of this. So these new types of practices of civil society that I just discussed vis-a-vis -vis the EU, uh, new types of actors and new types of and new visions have implications for European democracy, especially ahead of the Conference for the Future of Europe. And Nicolo will give us a little bit more details about this. Great. I was just about to send you a message to say we must move on to Nicola, although that really gave us a lovely overview of the report. So without further ado, I will turn to Nicola. Thanks, Mary, and thanks, uh, Rock, for uh, leading up to me. And Rock's also going to click through the slides. This is teamwork um, across, across, the, across Europe, indeed. I'm in Paris. Rock is, is somewhere in Poland, but we're working, <laughs> we're working together across borders. Um, so what Rock has been describing to you is that the nature of civil society and the nature of politics to some extent has been transformed or challenged over the past decade, decade and a half of crises. Um, and what has emerged from that, what we can see in the civil society fabric of Europe is to some extent an incipient a uh, new model of how democracy ought to work or a kind of prefiguration which just occasionally gets through into the institutions of a different kind of democracy uh, which we summarily call the 21st century uh, democracy and so where 20th century democracy had quite a strong division between a vertical dimension which was about trying to influence power um, by uh, talking with political parties and governments and a horizontal dimension which was about grassroots organization on a range of different issues. Um, now, not only at a European scale, but in national politics, people have been talking about a 45 degrees uh, form of democracy, which is about finding uh, the sweet spot between horizontal mobilizing approaches and institutional buy-in, if you like, and finding the tension that creates uh, the prospect of change. But what the implications of um, this change in the nature of politics in general have for European affairs, and given the European dimension of all of these crises, is that an extra dimension is brought in. So it's not just between vertical and horizontal, but there's also a transnational European dimension to the reflections and actions of many civil society actors across across Europe. So we call the European political space a kind of third dimension of politics and these innovative kinds of actors, insurgent actors, are constantly finding uh, and experimenting with a kind of equilibrium between horizontal, vertical and transnational approaches. And that um, configuration is what I've tried to describe as an, as an incipient European democracy, which is partly caused by and reacts to and tries to change a slightly dysfunctional European institutional setup. Um, so, Rock, if you click through to the next uh, slide, here is a small picture of 45 degree change in three dimensions. If it's small on your screen, you can find it in the report. Um, on one side of your screen in red is the 45 uh, degree theory of change at a national level where you've got a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension and one tries to find uh, an equilibrium between institutional buy-in and horizontal grassroots organization uh, 
on, on the blue side of your screen is the attempt to bring in a third dimension to this, which is about uh, the European dimension. So uh, Rob, click through to the next one. Um, the importance of this today really is that um, the European Union hasn't looked at the relationship between itself as a set of institutions and civil society since the exercise in creating a draft constitutional treaty around the millennium. Um, and our report shows that a lot has changed in the nature of civil society and politics in, in, in those 21 years. Uh, and so, as Rock mentioned, we're at the um, moment of a launch of the Conference on the Future of Europe, originally announced in 2019 by Ursula von der Leyen, and she was named as president of the European Commission, due to be launched last year on the 9th, 9th of May, but the pandemic and various inter-institutional uh, disagreements, it has to be said, uh, had led to a delay, which will potentially mean that it's meant to start on the 9th. There's still some threats to delay it even further because there's a lack of agreement between institutions, but we're pretty confident it's gonna start uh, this 9th of May. Um, so this conference on the future of Europe is meant to uh, think again about the, the shape of the European Union um, and the promise is that it's gonna put citizens at the center of the discussion about what the European Union ought to look like. There's a great demand from that. The European Commission's own surveys in Eurobarometer show that 90% of Europeans uh, demand that citizens' voices are taken more into, into account. Um, and if we step back and reflect a little, uh, despite the hiccups in putting together the Conference on the Future of Europe, there's something remarkable about the fact that in the middle of a pandemic, uh, the European Union is engaging in such an exercise at all. It either shows a kind of ambition or a kind of desperation. Uh, depending which way you look at it, but um, they're launching, the European Union is launching um, this uh, exercise with, which has created some, some big hopes um, uh, and big promises amongst civil society and citizens. Those civil society actors that have been following the discussions around the Conference on the Future of Europe and the journalists um, have, all in all, had a rather uh, negative view of what has been discussed uh, so far. There's um, been now over a year of delays caused by disagreements between the Council, the Commission and the Parliament about how this conference ought to be set up, how important its conclusions can be, uh, what the role of citizens ought to be and how, and how uh, much of a say they will have and in what ways over, um, over the conference. But uh, while this is a familiar story uh, in, in European affairs and perhaps civil society organizations that follow European affairs closely have grown a bit too familiar with this institutional bickering, um, the fact that there's quite a power struggle over this shows that um, there is uh, some fear on some people's parts that this process will open up some potentials for change and uh, a desire on other people's parts for saying, well, look, the world around the institutions has changed and we do need to uh, engage with that. And so this institutional battle um, is in a way a sign that uh, the European Union feels like it has to act and there's a disagreement about how to do it. And we could even see that this kind of institutional blockage, which reflects the current slightly dysfunctional nature of European decision-making, provides precisely a space for the citizens to take some initiative, um, quite as the, after all, much more dramatic crises, uh, financial crisis, migration crisis, and so on, have led to civil society organizing themselves, um, well, around the conference as well. Um, there's civil society organizing itself and. I want to mention at least one initiative called Citizens Take Over Europe, which I'm quite strongly uh, involved in. So, so Rock, carry on to the next um, slide. The conference is going to go on for the next year and a half, uh, but it's it's and it's and it's been times to coincide with the uh, to conclude at the time of the presidential elections uh, here in France, where I currently am. But no doubt, the um, conversation that is launched by the conference. Uh, will be continuing in the institutions and outside of the institutions for quite for quite some time. And indeed, 
uh, amongst the European decision makers, there's quite an awareness that sooner or later treaty change will be required uh, in the European Union. And uh, while treaty change is unlikely to emerge from this conference process, it's a little bit like a test run for how treaty change might uh, come about. Our report um, tries therefore to make proposals about how to uh, secure the productive involvement and the, um, the potential of a renewed civil society engagement across Europe in European affairs. And we come up with four uh, proposals for the Conference on the Future of Europe, but indeed uh, much beyond that. And I'll talk you through them very, very quickly. The first is to create a permanent European Citizens' Assembly. As part of the Conference on the Future of Europe, there is going to be some citizens' panels, 200 citizens um, gathered on four different citizens' panels to deliberate together and feed their recommendations into the plenary of the conference. And already in the institutions, um, some people are in favour of making this mechanism permanent uh, to engage citizens in decision making, not only at election times, but on an ongoing basis. We uh, broadly welcome this kind of idea of creating a European Citizens Assembly. Uh, there have been experiments with this kind of thing uh, in, in, in national settings. If we think of the Irish Citizens Assembly, which led to the referendum on uh, abortion, or uh, again here in France, the, the Climate Assembly, which has made recommendations to uh, the government about, about how to deal with climate change. Um, why not do this at a European scale? Why not even give the Strasbourg seat of the parliament over to a citizens assembly? Second uh, proposal is uh, to empower the regions and cities of Europe to uh, work together with civil society in new formations and find new solutions to common policy challenges. Over the past decade of crisis, we've seen cities and civil society often working together on issues as wide ranging as housing, access to housing, or how to uh, welcome and then integrate migrants and refugees. Um, cities have often been taking the lead and it's an easier, um, closer to the everyday citizen level at which to um, bring about political innovation. Why not do more to empower regions and cities uh, to uh, work together across Europe? There's something called the Committee of the Regions, a European institution, which could be, in a certain sense, repurposed precisely to facilitate this. The third um, recommendation is to have a secure and inclusive European citizenship. Um, there are too many people across Europe who are long-term permanent residents of the European Union but do not have European citizenship. Uh, and those of you who are in the UK or are British living in the rest of Europe know um, the problems that can come with uh, the fragility of European citizenship and how easily it can be taken away. Uh, so to underpin this democratic uh, engagement, European citizenship needs to be reinforced. It also needs to be uh, more welcoming by decoupling it from national citizenship so that non-EU nationals can become European citizens. And fourthly and finally, uh, there's the importance of extending and deepening the social pillar. This cycle of uh, crises from 2008, which has transformed uh, European civil society, started with the financial crisis and the gaping inequalities that emerged from it. Uh, and this crisis hasn't gone away. And indeed, it's, a, it's in these past months being deeply exacerbated by the pandemic and the recessions that are being um, um, created by it. Just today, the European leaders are meeting in Porto at the European Social Summit. So there is some awareness of the importance of reinforcing the social pillar, uh, but many civil society actors, I think across Europe would feel that the commitments that are in the Porto Summit are by no means ambitious enough and that the European Union needs to uh, make it absolutely central to its future plans to ensure, for example, uh, minimum income across the European Union, uh, minimum wages, uh, a standardized guaranteed uh, income if you become unemployed and other measures to reduce inequality and improve protection of people's 
uh, rights at work. So these are four proposals emerging from our report, which we consider to be um, really important for the European Union to take seriously, not only because they're important in their own right, but because they're the underpinnings of a kind of productive relationship between a renewed civil society and the European institutions going forward. Thank you, Nicola, that was great. And now we can actually hear from some of the activists who we were studying, which is very exciting. And I'm going to turn first to Mihaila. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this discussion. Um, I guess I'll just say a little bit uh, about me before, before I start commenting on the findings of the report. Um, my name is Michaela Pobudova and I'm the co-founder and director of Marina, which is a civic association um, working in Slovakia to support the integration of refugees and migrants. I think the reason why I was relevant uh, for this study was um, the fact that we were actually born out of the 2015 migration crisis. And the reason why we, why we came to be, why a group of people uh, got together and decided to, to put together a, a uh, an initiative um, to support uh, refugees at the time was that uh, we felt that uh, the political discourse and general media narrative was filled with uh, sort of negative uh, messages about um, people coming to Europe and there really was a vacuum uh, or, or a lack of any positive and constructive uh, messages that would show that Slovakia is a you know, a country that cares and that can show solidarity. So um, basically a group of people got together and we, we uh, put together an online campaign uh, that was calling for resettlement of uh, Syrian and Iraqi refugee families to Slovakia. And we were looking for uh, individuals and organizations to pledge that they would um, personally get involved with, uh, with the refugees integration should the government agree to, to resettle them. Um, this, uh, this campaign um, actually got relatively big quite quickly. We, we really didn't know what it would get to, but uh, we got over 2000 people who actually signed up and wanted to, wanted to help out. Uh, unfortunately, the government did not agree to resettle any refugees, um, but um, at the time we thought it would be such a pity to just let go of this network and this, this wheel of, um, of people in Slovakia. And we decided to, to establish an NGO that would support the integration of refugees who were already resident in Slovakia at the time. Um, I would maybe just like to, to also say before I comment on the, on the findings of the study that uh, I, I'm going to comment on on what I know or what I actually have experience with. Uh, so it's in no way definitive and it definitely does talk from, from, my, from my perspective, from me uh, being and working in Slovakia, which might be different in, in other countries. Um, so to the vision of Europe, um, to the normative popular and responsive, uh, I would definitely say that uh, I see myself as, as, uh, as agreeing with, with all, all three. I think the, the normative one is the one that um, is the closest to me. And I think that that was the one that I responded to most within the survey. Um, for me, Europe is an embodiment of, of values, of human rights, of social justice, of solidarity. And uh, uh, since Slovakia has signed up to it and is a member of the EU, uh, it's something that I can legitimately claim that Slovakia should uphold. So whatever I do with, with, with refugees and we do with refugees and migrants, I see that it, it uh, directly ties to, to the values that we have, we have signed up for. And therefore, whatever communication we have with the state, with the government agency, uh, we, we often mention that, you know, this is, this is in line with, uh, you know, what our commitments are or, or what we have claimed to, to, to believe in. Um, so we, we should do it and we, we try to encourage and push, push the government or local politicians to actually uh, do something about it. Uh, I would also just tie this normative vision to, 
to me being an instrumentalist. And I think that's, uh, that's definitely where I see myself. Uh, when I saw the report, I was thinking about where, where am I uh, amongst, the, amongst the ones that you named? And uh, I definitely am most uh, the instrumentalist. Um, so we, we actually, this, the, the grassroots movement started with us wanting to work on the ground. So we, we work directly with local communities. We, uh, we support individual refugees, children, families. Uh, we connect them with locals. We deliver Slovak language classes, further education to, to refugees. We organize community events, awareness raising events about migration and integration. And so on, so we, we really are um, working on the ground. What we have found is that often for us to deliver uh, sustainable solutions, um, we need to uh, create systemic changes or we need to push for changes in the law, changes in, in processes, in the divisions of agendas at governmental offices and in the, in the creation of new funding mechanisms that would actually enable you know, integration to be delivered at a consistent quality to all that need it. So what it does to us is that it moves, it moves me and my organization closer to, um, to the political level, but more in terms of advocating for change or, or, or pushing for changes um, 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 generally at ministerial level. If that doesn't work, we need to push at political level because often uh, some changes, especially when it comes to uh, relocation mechanisms or resettlements, that's, that tends to be a political decision, not, not, not really a, a governmental um, or, or, or sort of more execution-oriented uh, uh, agenda. Um, so uh, what we found is that it, it pushes, us, pushes us closer to the political level, and at the same time, um, um, often migration and migration crisis has brought very similar problems to, to all EU countries. And therefore we have found um, allies, um, NGOs working in different states that often, uh, given that uh, they have much more experience with uh, migration and with integration of refugees, they have already um, uh, put together initiatives or established best practices that we can actually we can actually just join or or um, uh, take over and, and duplicate basically in Slovakia and therefore we start slowly also moving to to the European level on a, on a practical basis um, what what it then does is that in order to 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 do what we do we need funding and we look first of all locally Often there is not enough funding locally uh, because this is not generally uh, a priority. Um, and therefore we need to look above for funding. And we tend to look at European mechanisms for funding. And European mechanisms uh, very often encourage um, sort of international cooperation within the EU, which helps us not only to, to create sort of uh, more lasting partnerships, but help us work together to deliver solutions uh, together on a European level. And the, the more we know each other, the more there is space to, to create sort of um, uh, pan-European um, advocacy campaigns or, or, or initiatives uh, that then we as a small organization, uh, we are happy to join and that we support basically from, from our, our local perspective. Um, I would get to the popular vision uh, of, of Europe. Um, I think as a, as a true uh, civil society um, representative, I think it, it's just generally a, a very a common sense uh, demand from our, from our part. I think we really like participative and inclusive processes. And uh, um, in Slovakia, I've just checked the statistics just to, 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 to give you relevant information. Uh, in the last um, elections um, to the European Parliament, we had the lowest uh, turnout. Uh, only 22% of, uh, of uh, eligible voters actually came to vote. Um, uh, silver lining is that actually that was the highest turnout uh, of Slovaks in the past four elections, but still, still very bad. 
Um, and generally, um, and, and, I, and I'm closer to, to my topic, so uh, to, to refugees and migration and the sort of most, most uh, publicly um, visible uh, issues that came from the EU uh, were quotas for the distribution of refugees and then last year, the, the EU Pact on Migration and Asylum. And both were seen and commented on by mainstream politicians as something that we don't have to do. Uh, uh, they, they basically, um, uh, uh, there is this understanding that, that Slovaks think that that's being imposed on us and we didn't take part in making these decisions. And even even mainstream politicians, uh, they they work with this information, and they 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 say that uh, we definitely won't have to do it. Don't worry, we don't have to do it. Uh, and there's always flexibility. And if anybody would push us to do anything, we will we will say no, and we will join the others in the V4, Visegrad Four, uh, our friends in Hungary, Poland, and Czech Republic, and uh, we will uh, not you know let anything. Uh, uh, that is not in our interest happen to us, and um, this is this is this is sort of a very common rhetoric when it comes to the EU in Slovakia. So, so I there is definitely this uh, democratic gap. I think that that's what you called it in the report um, here in Slovakia with regards to the EU and how Slovaks are represented at the decision table in in Brussels. I think what I what I also would want to um, add here is that um, from my perspective in Slovakia, um, my organization uh, definitely represents a minority attitude, um, which means that there is a risk, um, or a risk depends on who sees it, uh, that uh, should, should more people participate, which is definitely just a sort of general good, that it would lead to a dissolution of these uh, values that I hold dear. Um, and um, well then, um, but that's just, a, that's just a comment and I'll, I'll, I'll go on further. Um, with regards to the recommendations, um, the first one, Permanent Citizens Assembly, um, that uh, truly sounded like an interesting idea, but what I would find uh, a bit difficult is uh, its execution. I think uh, we would get to the issue of who actually would be represented, how would he or she be chosen, how many people would there be, what their agenda would be, you know, what what would be the enforcement of decisions made there. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit worried that we would sort of um, uh, create an institution that might not actually be functioning as, as, as well as we would maybe um, want it to. But, but it's definitely up, up for discussion. The second one about empowering cities. Uh, since I work in integration, that's, uh, I would support this 150%. Uh, generally, um, integration has been proven to be the best practice uh, across the EU and state integration uh, of refugees and migrants really isn't a, a functional model. And uh, it, it has to do with, you know, cities being closer to the, to, to the people that live there and, and so on. And they can uh, make the best use of resources uh, for, for, those, for those coming in. So, um, I would definitely uh, agree that, that this is this would be a great thing to do. Uh, generally, um, it's something that we're doing here in Slovakia as well. We've piloted an integration center on a municipal level in, in Nitra. It seems to be working well. Uh, what you, you tend to come across um, are barriers in terms of funding and uh, agenda or an understanding that uh, that is sort of my thing to do. Uh, we, we get this uh, sort of pushback from municipalities here where they feel like um, refugees or migrants are really not their thing, that it's, it's a thing of a state institution. It's, it's a ministry of social affairs uh, and labor or, or a ministry of interiors business and not mine. So I think sort of more of an um, 
explanation that there is an agenda that, that is theirs, that they're best placed to deal with it and uh, also make sure that they're uh, avail uh, there's um, available funding um, for, for cities to actually um, deliver uh, integration services to refugees and migrants. Uh, the third one about Euro European citizenship, I, I must admit I know very uh, little about it and I was wondering about whether um, there would be any technical advantages uh, or practical advantages to holding a European citizenship. Uh, I definitely do see the, the soft value of, of a European citizenship and uh, in it, even if I own it, to, to sort of reaffirm the equality of, of citizens across Europe. Uh, but it's also, um, you know, generally uh, just a piece of paper does not make me include it uh, from one day to another. And uh, I think any, any of, uh, of these uh, sort of more formal measures uh, should definitely be accompanied by, by more soft measures that support the social cohesion and uh, the prevention of discrimination and racism uh, across um, Europe. And the last one, uh, fully agreed, just to make sure that it's not just, um, just uh, economic measures uh, that address social fractures across the EU, but also, also um, um, measures that uh, support uh, better mutual understanding, um, um, tolerance and respect uh, to, to differences. And I would end there. I think I might have run out of my time. I, I apologize. Um, and uh, I, I, I uh, give the, the word back to Mary. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being so thoughtful about all of this and how it relates to your situation. And so now, last but not least, I will turn to Marika. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, so also to just start off with a bit of an introduction about who I am. Uh, so my name is Marika Kukuk. I'm a, a Dutch citizen. I live in the city of Utrecht, that is just quite close to Amsterdam. And uh, as mentioned, I uh, was recently elected as a uh, member of parliament in the Netherlands. Uh, we had elections on the 17th of March. And I uh, represent uh, Volt, the uh, pan-European uh, party uh, on the local, on the national level. And uh, for us, that's a bit of a first. Uh, so we are a pan-European party and we have uh, one member in the European Parliament. And we're also uh, represented at local level in Germany, in Bulgaria and in Italy. Uh, and for us, this is the first time that we're actually also at the national level um, represented in a political sphere. Uh, so this is for us also a very new and exciting time where um, we see one of our initial objectives actually um, being becoming reality, namely to be present at a with a similar program to be present at all three levels of um, of politics, European, national, and local. Um, and so we're at the moment sort of finding out how to best uh, use that and how that looks like in in, in practice. Uh, so this actually, this report sort of came at the exact right time, and I'm very happy that you were willing to share it with us. Um, I, uh, when I was reading it, um, I was, I recognized a lot of things that were uh, said, especially in terms of um, what was mentioned within the surveys and, and how people viewed uh, Europe and your, as how they see themselves as Europeans and how they see the European institutions. Um, uh, that's, I think, a lot of it goes to the core of why uh, a party such as Volt actually exists, that we were initially established not as a political party, but more as a political movement or a grassroots movement in, uh, in response to all kinds of challenges that were represented. So uh, Volt's um, sort of origin is a direct result of Brexit. So there were actually three Europeans that uh, were friends already. They got together and they saw Brexit happen and they said, well, this is not how we picture uh, European society. And we want to do something against that. And that's how the ball sort of started rolling. And uh, well, now we're, we're three years uh, further along and, and now we're actually part of sort of the political uh, as well. But I've, to me, that was always a very important part of joining Fault that it was not purely a political mechanism because I see politics as one of the many means to uh, in a peaceful way change society. 
and not as a, an end goal in itself. And that's actually also how we see the European institutions. It's not that we uh, see the European Union, the institutional aspect of it as a, a goal or as a, a sort of ideal that has to exist uh, regardless, but it's a means to solve uh, big challenges that we're all facing with. And I think uh, what Michaela was uh, talking about, about the, the, the way that we treat migrants uh, is one of the main challenges that we are right now confronted with, and especially how we keep our common values there. Uh, so when I was reading a report, I, I think what I mostly recognized is this uh, idea of a normative um, European or, or starting with common values. Um, and that's um, probably also uh, why I find that so important is because that's something that I've been missing in the European Union for the last uh, maybe 15, 20 years, uh, because we didn't work from common values towards institutionalization. We kind of started with institutions and we, there are some common values, but they're not uh, explicated. And I think the criticism of the European Union that we sometimes hear is in some ways correct, is that it works, it functions for a small group of people, it functions for corporations. And one of the, one of the core reasons that that is the situation right now is that we lack common values. And that's kind of what we tried with Fold to, to change or to find people with uh, common ideas about the society, uh, to start with values such as solidarity, uh, per, uh, other inclusion, um, but also to work towards social equality. And from there to kind of build up and to see what do you need on what kind of level of government uh, to actually reach that, that vision, that ideal of the European society in 50 years. Um, so in that sense, uh, I also really liked reading about the uh, 45 degree axis, because I, I think that is really something that we try to aspire as well, to not be purely political, uh, but to to um, sort of be the political translation of movement on, on the ground, of grassroots, and especially uh, the local level. Because I think most people, the, the importance of, or, or the, the value that you feel, or the, the value that you feel that you represent as citizen in society starts at the local level. Because that's in your own neighborhood, in your own city or town, uh, that's where you feel uh, most at home. That's where you want to see um, things that you uh, relate to, that, that's where you want to see your values represented, basically. So I think that is what we uh, in Europe should aspire to, is to have the, the most uh, important decisions starting at local level. And at the national level, so where I currently am, uh, should more should, should sort of refocus in its, in its, uh, in its goal in the, in the political sphere. We should not be um, the, the ones that sort of carry the torch, but we should be the ones that take it over and then represent uh, the, the local concerns at the European level. And the European level is where we should have the broad frame of how we should uh, address challenges. That's, that's, in my perspective, the ideal Europe. Um, so a lot of the recommendations in the reports I have here, uh, I can fully su subscribe to. I think that's, uh, that's indeed what we should work towards to. And um, one of the main challenges I think there is to work really towards European citizenship. I think it's also one of the most important ones that we really feel that we um, should not just be, should not just have solidarity out of pragmatism, but because we have common tradition, common history. Uh, but that's also the hardest because I think that is where a lot of people feel threatened in their identity. Uh, and that's, uh, there's a huge concern that there will be no room for individuality and no room for local traditional differences anymore. So for us, I think for, for Volt uh, and for others that are also working uh, in any kind of movement towards this kind of more European feeling, I think the main challenge is to uh, counter that, that fear through dialogue. And so I'm a big, huge fan of the uh, Permanent Citizens Assembly, because that I think to me is the ideal place to have dialogue instead of being um, in the, when you are in, in, in any kind of debate or when you respond to a referendum, it's always a sort of a yes or no question. It sim simplifies reality too much. And I think citizens assemblies, uh, local, national and European level are uh, the ideal place to uh, get to understand each other. And I think what would be helpful in that as well is to have a um, sort of Europeanized media. 
where uh, not just on politics, because now media, when, when Europe is discussed, it's often about politics, uh, what's going on in Brussels or what did the European Commission do or not do. Uh, but I think it's very important for us to, uh, to meet each other through media. So, for example, to have a European news that, that sort of zooms in on a, on a town in Italy and on a town in Bulgaria and to see the similarities and to see the, the similar challenges that we're faced with. Um, so it sort of speaks to move towards um, more like a Europe as a, a coffee shop or coffee house where you meet each other, a cafe, and to move away from Europe as a, an economic power. Or as I think that's the Europe that we've been currently living in, which is basically beneficial to corporations and perhaps to individuals that are already kind of well off. Uh, but we should work towards a Europe that works for everybody. And that starts with... Uh, well, with, with, with a local level, with getting to know each other and, and actually feel more as Europeans. Uh, but that's also something that should sort of um, come from uh, self-reflection and motivation from people. So I think that is where politics can play a marginal role, uh, except that we can provide the, the right example. And we can also fix the institutional flaws that we have. So for, I read in the report also uh, one of the main crises that um, brought Europeans together was the Euro crisis. And where a lot of countries were hurt is because we don't have the fiscal measures to mitigate the negative consequences of a uh, financial crisis nowadays that we did have 20 years ago because we didn't have the same, um, same coin that we were using. So I think that is one of the things that politics should do. And the other thing is that, uh, and that is what I also hope to do now as a representative, is to uh, represent Europe also on different levels than on the European level, so on national and the, and the local level. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely keep this report quite close at heart. And uh, well, thanks again for inviting. Um, and well, I'm looking forward to the, to the questions to open the discussion for us. Great, well, thank you so much. I think maybe we can call this the assembly in Strasbourg, the European Coffee House, <laughs> and we can have lots of cups of coffee for us all to discuss. I think that's great. And I hope people in Britain who are no longer in the European Union can still join Vault. <laughs> so it can, so that being pan-European doesn't necessarily mean being part of the European Union. Much there's a, there's actually, a, at the moment, a campaign on rejoining the EU. So we're, we're definitely still present in, uh, in the UK. Oh, good. Well, I'm part of that campaign. I mean, I, I should be part of that campaign. So that's great. So that's wonderful. So, so far we have, I'm going to ask two questions and then I'm going to go back to the panel in a different order. And then we'll see if we have time for further questions. So let me just tell you what the questions are. So one from Sonia Prieto, perhaps the extension and deepening, real deepening, could be the real way for people to feel more confident about Europe. How many people, ordinary people, really know about the conference on the future of Europe? Why is it so difficult to make a real good communication about Europe? So that's one question. And the second question uh, is from Eleanor, uh, Heim Swift, I hope I pronounced it right. From the presentation, it seems that the rise of a more proactive European civil society is primarily in support of the European Union. How has the rise of Euroscepticism, anti-EU movements, had any effects on the shifts perceived in the study? For instance, has the research also revealed a rise of anti-EU civil society groups or rise of purely national civil society advocacy groups? I think that question is much more for rock than, but I think everybody might have a go at it. And I just suggest we start in the opposite order. So I'll go, I'll ask Marika to start and then we'll go backwards. Sure, yeah. Uh, so to start off with the, the question about why is it so difficult to make a uh, real good communication at Europe? Uh, in, in my view, I think there are two main obstacles um, about that, that prevent us from really understanding what Europe is about and especially how the European institutes uh, influence our life and how we can influence them back. Uh, mainly, the first one I think is mainly that 
at least in the Netherlands, uh, speaking from my own experience, is that in our educational system, there is an emphasis on, on national uh, politics uh, and, and how national institutes work. So you kind of, uh, you're told from a young age how, for example, parliament works and how laws are being um, uh, reviewed and, and how they pass, et, et cetera. But we're, we don't put the same focus on how European institutes work. So a lot of it is in putting the same kind of importance to understanding European democracy uh, as you put towards your own national democracy. Because we, we find that, I, I always found that a bit strange. We find it very important that young people know about how democratic institutes work on the national level and on the local level. And we teach them the, our constitution. But then we pay very little uh, time proportionally to how Europe works and, and what kind of fundamental rights do you have in, in Europe and how we protect them. So that's, that's one thing. And I think the, the second thing, why it is quite difficult to communicate properly about Europe and um, has a lot to do with the um, frame of reference where we start our thinking. So I think still a lot of uh, politicians, uh, but also companies, we still from, think from a national perspective and we are convinced that protecting our sovereignty and our national interests is best done at the national level. And I think from, especially since the, um, since globalization sort of started and especially the last 20 years, you kind of see a, a trend towards not being able to protect your national interest and values um, because you focus only on the national. Because some, some things are, a, trans, some, a lot of things actually transcend borders nowadays. And we, in our thinking, haven't really quite caught up with the idea that sometimes it's actually you better protect your own sovereignty when you give away your power to uh, the supranational. In this case, I think the European Union. That is a um, bit of an abstract thing to, to, to talk about, but I think it's the core of why it's difficult to, uh, to really see the influence of the European Union. So I think for, for politicians and other kind of uh, leaders or public figures, it, will, it, it is necessary to constantly um, show that that, for example, European Union, when we have a climate accord, that is in our national interest. So it is actually better uh, protecting our sovereignty and our values when we give away our competences in certain regards um, uh, from the national when we move that to the European level, for example. And that might also go vice versa. So it might also be better to um, uh, move competences to uh, local level because that's where you can better uh, have a dialogue with citizens for example uh, but we have to kind of move away from the idea that the national is the most important and and that's when we can probably start a better conversation about Europe as well. It could also be the other way around that we'll never get away from it until we start communicating but anyway yeah. <laughs> shall I shall we uh, now go to uh, Michaela. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I really like this question because uh, truth be told, I actually didn't know about the conference uh, on the future of Europe before I got asked to be a respondent in this survey. So I did not myself know about it and I'm active in the civic space. Um, and um, in the preparation for this discussion, I took a look at uh, the, the representative office of the European Commission in Slovakia, and there was one press release about it. Uh, and there was also one press release um, uh, that went out through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I, I'm, I'm inclined to think that probably very little people, ordinary people actually know that this conference is actually uh, just about to take place. Um, and why, why is it? Uh, I think I would definitely agree with Marike that there are some structural issues about how we uh, talk about um, the European Union and that it really isn't integrated in our educational system either. And it's, it doesn't sort of go hand in hand with sort of uh, democratic education. Uh, it, it, it's an add-on. It's definitely just something, just 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 a, a level for, further away from from just just uh, what we would generally learn. Um, I would also say, though, uh, that touches on the the, the one press release uh, is that I I feel like there's not enough uh, communication 
from, from the EU towards the national level. Uh, I, I see a gap there uh, as well. Uh, I also see that uh, our own national politicians who represent us uh, in the EU, um, they both uh, sometimes don't take an active enough role to represent us, and then they do not actively communicate about the decisions that were made and where they where we were represented uh, on their behalf. So uh, I, I see that there is definitely um, sort of an our, our fault uh, explanation as well here. Uh, and then there is a there is a portion of uh, of the politicians which I think um, do practically undermine uh, the European Union um, and often uh, you know, take opportunistic uh, positions uh, and use EU as a scapegoat just to get more um, popular votes. So, so I think there's a, um, it, to an extent, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a, a deep issue um, that will, will take a long time, I think, to, to actually uh, overcome. The question is, of course, are we already, are we trying, are we beginning to change? That's what we hope in this report. But I'm going to, Nicola and Rock might also want, not only respond to these questions, but also might respond to respond to Michaela's and Mareka's comments. So Nicola. Thanks, Mary. Um, I'm really pleased that the, the topic of citizenship education has come up because I think that that's absolutely essential and it's and we should call out in a way that it's scandalous that um that this that citizenship education about european affairs is so poor uh, but not only is it scandalous it's probably indicative of something else and what i think it's indicative of is that um people who are holding national power uh, are quite reluctant to give up their um dominance um, and that includes politicians but it also includes multinationals and financial interests and cultural players even newspapers and media uh, people who are currently doing quite well out of the the national system or at least out of the combination of a national system and a largely dysfunctional european system um, why would they want to change that why would they want to change that unless there is uh, sufficient pressure to force them to do it um, and I think that th that's the beginning of an answer to, to, to some other questions as well. Why is it difficult to do good communication about Europe? Well, it's not that the European Commission and the European Parliament don't try. Uh, they actually spend quite a lot of money on this. Uh, the communication, though, is terrible and it usually doesn't, it doesn't get anywhere near to the citizens. And when it does, it's very, very boring. Um, they're somehow structurally incapable of communicating in an interesting way. Um, and part of that structural incapability is that there's, there's no political dynamic to it. Um, and so the questions of, for example, the, the real politicization of the European Union, the creation of transnational political parties, is what Volta has been doing with, with others trying as well, seems to me to be crucial to creating a kind of communicative dynamic inside uh, the European Union, which people might find interesting and engaging. Another sign a symptom of this would be actually in the Dutch elections where if I Marika knows be better than me but I believe that there was plenty of discussion in advance of the elections and uh, suddenly people realized there wasn't so much discussion of European affairs there was a campaign the elephant in the room no that it would, on, on social media saying what about the European elephant you know the, it, the, the Netherlands position on issues like uh, you know, financial solidarity in the COVID crisis is actually quite controversial. Also in the Netherlands, why aren't people talking about this? And so through a bottom-up campaign, it was forced onto the agenda. And no doubt um, the election results also partly uh, reflect that. And so last, last comment, which also touches on the, on, on the second question, is I think that we have to be a little bit careful about talk about European values and everybody having to agree with the same values. Um, I think that, 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 that's, that there's, there's a truth in that and, it, and it's important, but we have to keep a balance uh, with rights. We should all have the same rights. 
that's also something that European citizenship should be about, right? What was the practical impact of European citizenship where it should give you rights and adequate protection of those rights? When we talk about what those rights should be, there should be more of them. That's what it means. It's not just a piece of paper. Uh, so we should all have the same rights and there should be space for democratic divergence about values. And those values will be generated both through uh, education, but also through political engagement political engagement in different political parties, in civil society, and we, we will find that we have different values, and that's fine, as long as they're within some democratic um, bounds. And so um, I think that's also one of the things we were trying to show with the report, is that civil society, and that's the good news, has gone beyond a kind of stale debate about whether the European Union is good or bad, and at least certain parts of, of civil, European civil society have started to talk about what kind of Europe do we want. Uh, and that's the beginning of a formulation of values, which are not all the same, but which are articulated politically with a European dimension. I'll let, I'll let Rock uh, continue after me. Thank you very much. Just briefly to respond to your uh, insights about the uh, about the report. I, I'm really pleased uh, with uh, with uh, with with your perceptions of this, especially Michaela, uh, Michaela, um, uh, and especially that sort of trajectory of crisis realization, response, and then organization. Like this is, I mean, this is what we. This was this wasn't this was not part of the research design. This was part of the finding, right? This this pattern being replicated across the continent where different forms of activity uh, were forged in response to the different crises and then became parts of, uh, of, of the, of the uh, public sphere of the civil society landscape and then start articulating new ways of, 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 of action. Um, uh, so this was, uh, this is, this is definitely uh, uh, this is something that was it was found found itself in the report thanks to you and thanks to others who who signaled the same the same trajectory, uh, including then advocacy on an administrative and political level, both European and local and national and local. Find if, uh, looking for funding more on the European level because you don't have the support on the on the local you don't have the resources on the local level but you don't have the support on the national level, for example. So those transnational alliances, both in terms of ideas, but also in terms of structure and, and, and uh, in terms of funding. Um, uh, but also something that you mentioned that I, that I really, uh, that needs to be addressed is this, because we, we looked into the center of Europe from the margins, that there is this perception in among the populations, national populations, especially in Central Eastern Europe, that somehow their voices aren't heard. And that is partly a problem of communication, of an ability of the lack of knowledge of how the European Union works, but also this somewhat sort of post-colonial uh, uh, position in which, which Central Eastern European um, uh, uh, societies find themselves in, uh, or colonial, if, if depending on the country that you look at. I mean, those dynamics sort of, over, uh, uh, overlapping and uh, and 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 we knew, we we shouldn't disregard them. We shouldn't disregard the perceptions of of, of, the, of that that people hold, and 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 especially how then they translate into political action. This this question of being being included, being heard, being um, part of the discussion. Uh, uh, Marika, absolutely fascinated by the fact that you are a direct result of Brexit. This is something that I think maybe I read somewhere or heard, but it would sort of escaped my, my um, uh, uh, maybe I forgot about it. Uh, and also the idea that the EU is, is a means to an end and not a goal in itself, right? So we're, 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 I think we've moved past the founding fathers of the European Union, right? We, we don't no longer look at the EU as a sort of universalist uh, incarnation of either uh, uh, Roman Christendom or, or the French Republic, for that matter, uh, but, a, but, a, but a vehicle for something else. And this is especially visible, again, in Central Eastern Europe, where countries that have shed the yoke of, of Soviet uh, 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 control uh, 
or even you know regained independence like in the Baltic states now see the Europe Europe as a guarantor of national independence of cultural diversity of of national sovereignty uh, etc um, and again, the, and, and also your point about solidarity, that it's that it's not about, not about pragmatism, but about values, but about respect and, and that and respect for tradition and identity. And I think this is something that was very much missed in the um, debate about Brexit from the pro-European side. The Remain campaign was completely focused on the on the quid pro quo dimension of European integration, completely giving uh, up this. Uh, values uh, uh, led uh, argument which really lay, lies at the foundation of the of of of, of, Euro of different modalities of european integration including the european convention of human rights and the european union and this is something that also is very much visi was visible in the in our in-depth studies in southern and in central eastern europe so the experience of authoritarianism whatever its uh, dimension was uh, be that fascist or communist means that those the populations in those countries um, really see uh, Europe as more than just a economic sphere. But I think in the UK, it was also a result of a concerted effort of, of, of 30 years of, of ideology, both from the left and the right, just disregarding Europe and looking at only at it from an economic perspective. Um, and I love the fact that you called the Euro Europe a cafe. I think Jurgen Habermas, if, if he was if he was at the, joining us here today, he'd be he'd be thrilled. Um, uh, in response to the question that Mary mentioned, um, so this report is only focused on on Europe on civil society that addressed European issues or engaged in Euro on the European level explicitly. Uh, so there were very few examples of uh, people who had a much more skeptical um, view on the process of European integration as such. Most of those uh, uh, of, of such civil society actors do not mention Europe explicitly if, if they're against it. Uh, however, this was the key of, 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 of for, our, for, for our methodological key. Uh, but this, uh, these topics have been addressed within our research consortium. It's called Europe for the Many, europeforthemany.com. Uh, there are other reports uh, about the dangers of um, authoritarian dangers to democracy um, uh, because of COVID-19. There's a report called The Future of European Democracy um, about the um, decline of substantive democracy throughout Europe. Uh, there are, uh, there's, there's a report on populist politics in, in Germany um, and also uh, a report on uh, the visions of, of Europe among different political spectrums. Uh, uh, parties in the European Parliament. Uh, so those of you who are interested in that kind of, uh, in the, in the right-wing populist or nationalist and anti-European mobilization can find more resources there at europeforthemany.com. However, our report focuses on uh, civil society actors who, uh, again, operate in the Europe, European civic space and seek change on the European level. Thank you, Raul. I think we've got a few more minutes. So I'm just going to take a couple more questions. I mean, one was really addressed to Michaela, but I think it's a more general question from Dara Clown, which was how, do, how can we represent normative progressive values when the majority of people might not hold those values themselves? I mean, that's a really big question. And the other, which is really addressed to uh, Mareka, but I also think, again, it's a more general question, is uh, Volt will participate in the Dutch municipal elections next year. How is Volt aiming to translate its pan-European ideas to the local context? And what could Volt's political agenda add to the lives of citizens on the local level? So I think though that's a sort of, we could all be thinking about that question in general. And in order to get a completely different order, I'll start with Michaela. All right, so, so I will um, address the question about how can we, how can we spread these uh, progressive values in the society, if I understand it correctly. Um, 
uh, I think and if I knew we promote European promote. values in a society that has a very different set of values, how can we promote progressive values for you? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that we're trying to work out every day, to be honest. Um, I think that what we've what we have come to um, and what seems to work um, or what has some proven impact, uh, though that is quite difficult. Um, um, basically because I work with the refugees and migrants, the values that I operate with most are, you know, solidarity, human rights, inclusion, diversity, anti-discrimination, anti-racism. Um, and we're we're working with a so-called um, um, contact theory that uh, people one day uh, have a positive constructive contact with uh, a member of sort of a different group, um, they tend to have later on more positive views about this person. So what we try to do is uh, organize community events and uh, engagement uh, events where, where um, Slovaks or locals from across Slovakia get a chance to meet someone who is a refugee or who's different, who's other, in a sort of a, a, a um, slightly facilitated or moderated manner. That, that's something that, that we do try to do as an organization. Uh, secondly, and this is something that we, we have also planned to do some research on, is um, um, communication, good communication, especially from people who hold power over language, which, is, which tend to be politicians, uh, public uh, personas, uh, um, media uh, people or people who are really um, sort of active in, in, in your eye or ear. Um, they should uh, start communicating, uh, communicating more sensitively and inclusively about others. Uh, what we can do there is you know, campaign, try to convince them to, to speak differently uh, about uh, about refugees and migrants. But uh, that is um, that is uh, definitely a, a big chunk of work to do, uh, but definitely not not uh, futile. Um, and obviously, if there is more pressure coming from outside, from the level of the EU or or from other uh, organizations or institutions, that would definitely be um, be supportive to this to this end um, and generally um, and that I am a big proponent of this is uh, good sensitive education uh, we have some um, contact with people at the Ministry of Education and what they find is that there are a lot of uh, NGOs actually who want to get their agendas into the curriculum and uh, the, the, the experts in education tend to tell me that uh, what you actually want is for people to be taught critical thinking and, uh, and sort of sensitivity to issues. You don't necessarily have to teach them about migration and integration as such. So I think it's, it's about uh, sort of very, um, uh, in, a, in a very smart way, sort of design um, education from, from, you know, kindergarten, primary, secondary schools, where, where these values are, are sort of integrated in a seam, seamless way into, you know, what's, what's, what's just generally being taught. And I think that that would be my uh, three nuggets of wisdom, <laughs> and I'll stop there. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to hear any, any other um, thoughts or suggestions for how this could be done. That's an area of interest of ours. That's great. Um, okay, I'll go to Rock next. And actually, Rock, I think as well as whichever of these questions you want to take, I noticed in the chat somebody saying there's no European public sphere. And I actually think what we're discuss discovering is an emerging European public sphere. So you might want to say something about that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I think I think this is uh, maybe I'll take this one first. So I think this is one of the, our biggest finding. I think um, as much as um, there was a very much a positive momentum for building Europe on an institutional level uh, throughout the decades uh, in in different regions of Europe, depending on on their on the time when they joined the European Union or. or, or or, 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 or forged or put together the European Union, and then that kind of waned uh, 
and also was put under strain by, by the different crises. So we definitely see a huge disenchantment with, with the European Union that still um, is, uh, uh, very much lingers in countries like Greece. But that risk, uh, reaction, to that, but that disenchantment, the, um, that um, um, disappointment with how uh, your, uh, um, United Europe works also um, led to a critical re-engagement. And I think the, the word critical here, being, here op being operative here, is that, again, like Marieke, she, they, most of the civil society activists that we uh, uh, interview that we spoke to, don't fetishize the European Union. They don't love the European Union and its institutions, the Berlin Amount. They don't, they don't have a portrait of, 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 uh, of Ursula von der Leyen or, or, or you know, or uh, Jean-Claude Juncker for that matter, under mantle or even a little EU flag. It, I mean, this goes beyond, I mean, <laughs> this goes beyond that, absolutely. So they, they, but they, but they subscribe to a notion uh, that is driven by values that Europe is there to serve a purpose. And that is very much um, informed by their national uh, experiences. So I would, I would definitely argue against that comment. I would say that there is a European public sphere, but it, it's built through the sort of the mosaic of different European stories uh, uh, that are woven into European history. And we cannot, dis we cannot uh, disregard this. Europe will always be something else for, 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 for each of the countries or even subnational groups and minorities involved. But also, it's forged through the the recent experiences of crisis, and and, and Marika also mentioned um, media. I think right now, when we're looking at different national um, media landscapes and and the way the recovery fund, the next generation EU, is discussed, uh, we we see a huge qualitative change in how in how regular uh, every for everyday coverage on European uh, matters unfolds. Uh, I mean, what is it? What is a European public sphere? Is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it a news outlet that only discusses European issues? Absolutely not. Na and that's what we find. National issues are European issues. Local issues are European issues. For example, uh, an issue that is uh, uh, very um, difficult in where I am right now in Poland are the so-called LGBT free zones. So, so there were a few... Um, uh, municipalities, or even one of the subnational voivodeships that were uh, that uh, adopted these pro-family proclamations. One of its stipulations being that this is an LGBT ideology-free zone. Those uh, uh, those uh, legislation as were drafted by a right-wing think tank. Uh, that is uh, partially, allegedly partially funded by the Kremlin, uh, but is also very much in uh, in cahoots with with the current administration um, in Poland, um, effectively rendering these municipalities LGBT free zones, uh, or at least in the public's perception and in the perception of the LGBT people living there. Uh, many of those uh, municipalities have now lost their access to Norwegian Liechtenstein. And um, and and um, uh, Icelandic structural funds, uh, and are also uh, uh, now being interrogated uh, by the European Commission for breach of Europe's fundament fundamental values. Uh, obviously, the, the government in Poland has come to their support, but we clearly see that uh, places like Vila Movica or uh, Krasnik, <laughs> which none of you know where they are. <laughs> Uh, uh, are now very much embroiled in a, in a pan-European conversation that involves values. So, so uh, the way we perceive and respect and treat LGBT people, um, European funding, and and and, and political uh, and political dynamics between between the local governments, between the national government in Warsaw, between the European Commission, and between the different states. And very much in the global sort of sphere as well, because, because let's not kid ourselves, the anti-LGBT agenda in Europe is very much uh, inspired by Vladimir Putin and, and his cronies and, and Alexander Lukashenko. And uh, uh, what is happening to gay people in Chechnya is akin to a genocide. And it's very much uh, uh, done from political, for political reasons. So these people who uh, un, un, uh, 
who who perpetrate these kinds of uh, um, uh, these kinds of uh, platforms and and uh, campaigns in Europe uh, are, are very much on uh, uh, in cahoots with 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 people like Vladimir Putin. Gosh, what a fascinating example! And now to Mareka. Yes, um, maybe to, to just also to sort of um, um, give an idea about how to talk or how to uh, yeah how to work with progressive values if we don't all hold the same values. Uh, I think uh, earlier uh, Nicola mentioned I think that we have all have the same rights, but we don't all have the same values, and I think that's really correct that we we should not move towards a Europe that sort of dictates what we should think. Uh, but there's a lot of gray area in between having the same rights and having the same values. I think that is what Europe should be for. We should uh, have a dialogue about our values and get to understand each other uh, within the boundaries of, of human dignity and, and basic fundamental rights. And I think the example of, of Rock just now in Poland is, is a clear example of lowering ourselves beyond that uh, fundamental basis, basically. Um, and to me, what is fascinating we started vault uh, we have progressive values that's very clear also from from our policies that we have um and what was to me really interesting is that europeans all over europe kind of jumped in into the the, the fault um vibe basically and, and they all sort of uh said well this is policies that i can get behind uh from poland to the netherlands to, to spain and that to me is really interesting. I think values transcend borders. And that is especially why we should have that um, discussion or that dialogue on the European level. In my ideal uh, world in 50 years, we will also have transnational parties that run on perhaps conservative uh, values. And we would have a discussion or, or debate on how you then eventually want to shape your society. And I think part of um, working towards similar values or to uh, uh, at least an understanding of each other's values is to create a support base. And that is, I think, where uh, politicians also play an important role. So uh, one of the topics I will be focusing on also in the parliament is migration and asylum. And uh, one of the things we just uh, sort of launched with Fold Europe is the campaign called Europe Welcomes. And that is uh, specifically um, the, the objective of that campaign is to show how many municipalities in all over Europe are willing and able to take in more refugees. And I think that's an, a great example of sort of um, having a dialogue in that sense and, and trying to create a support base for a particular kind of value of inclusion or solidarity. And I think that is what politicians on all levels should work a lot more towards to instead of just talk about policies, but to talk about what kind of society do you want and to create a support base. Um, and that sort of leads in into what Volt might be doing during the municipality elections next year. Um, that is, uh, that's always the core of, of where we start uh, thinking about what can Volt contribute on any kind of level is what are the core values and what do you want to achieve in the society. And in this case, municipal municipality elections, we will discuss what, what kind of municipality do we want? What kind of uh, city do we want together? And in that sense, Volt has a bit of experience because we already run in local elections in um, well, Germany, in Bulgaria, and Italy. And what um, usually happens, and I, I think that will also happen this year, is that we will look for best practices in other uh, cities or other uh, uh, municipalities. So one of the, um, the things that um, I found fascinating is that Volt Hamburg was running its campaign and then they contacted Volt Rotterdam and they said, well, let's join uh, our campaigns because we're both major cities uh, that have a harbor and we both want to work to making that harbor uh, more sustainable and to have sort of a green transition in that industry. And so there we can learn a lot from each other and um, we can, and that helps during the campaign by discussing that with, other, with people on the local level, with, with Dutch people next year to discuss, well, what do you want to improve or what would you like to see different? And then to kind of, discuss how other cities such as Berlin or uh, Hamburg have already addressed that and how we could kind of easily borrow from each other. And I think there's, um, to be honest, I think it's sometimes easier to be a pan-European party on the local level because that's where people um, understand or they, we meet the same challenges, in, especially when you look at cities. Cities all over Europe have the same challenges. And so that's, it's way easier to then discuss the benefits of being pan-European and of having the same ideas. 
uh, because it's just easier to, to borrow best practices from each other. And on a national level, it's sometimes harder because there we also meet not just what do you want to solve, but also uh, what kind of tradition do you have or what kind of identity do you have? So that's a far, far more difficult discussion. Um, so Volt Netherlands or Volt Utrecht, for example, uh, in my hometown, I know they're already preparing uh, a policy program that is similar in line with our European and national uh, policy program. And uh, they are already discussing now with uh, members of Volt, but also with just interested people all over Utrecht. Uh, what is it that you want, want to see different or what do you find important uh, for the next elections? And uh, so that's, uh, that's how we will tackle the municipality elections next year. That's great. Thank you so much. And we'll end with Nicolo. Uh, and Nicolo, I think one issue that came up earlier, in addition to these two questions, when Michaela was talking about, was she said she thought she liked the idea of the European Citizens' Assembly, but, you know, who would be part of it? What power would it have? And I don't know if you have any ideas about that you might want to add. Uh, but also it might kind of lead us into thinking, how do we take this conversation further and how do we make it a contribution to the conference on the future of Europe? Yeah, okay, I will, I will come to that. I wanted to make, uh, so I've got rather a lot of thoughts about that. So I, um, <laughs> and, uh, I will make two quick points first that I wanted to bring up. One is that um, in terms of, um, of promoting progress, what, you, what we could call progressive values in a society which is which 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 um, many people are not sharing those views. I think that one thing that's really important that we don't mention as much as we perhaps should in the report is what is problematically called the feminization of politics, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean um, women leaders, although that can help, but it means uh, a, a different way of doing politics and a politics which is perhaps more focused on uh, care for one another than on forms of toxic masculinity. And I think that the point I want to make about that is that um, there's opportunities. Uh, the world provides us with opportunities to change the way that uh, values are developed amongst, amongst citizens. And this last couple of years of pandemic has made it clear to everybody the importance of themes like care um, and mutual support. And this real world experience is a basis on which we can um, regenerate a, a different society. So um, that was one quick point. The second uh, quick point is again, something that goes slightly beyond our discussion, but I think given the title of the um, event, it's, it's worth remembering that uh, earlier on in this cycle of crises, there were other insurgents um, with progressive values, um, no, led by men, actually, if you think of Syriza and Podemos. And, and just this last couple of days, we've seen um, the somewhat spectacular uh, fall of Pablo Iglesias in the Madrid elections. And there's, of course, a lot of things to be said about that. But a kind of simplistic point I want to make is that perhaps um, Syriza and Podemos, in their spectacular uh, election gains in the context of, of, of the financial crisis were responding very strongly to social fracture, um, but perhaps guilty of something like magical thinking about the way the European Union really works and what it would be possible to achieve. Um, I feel like uh, one of the reasons for that is that they weren't in, I embedded in a trans-European civil society that had consolidated its links and built understanding. Um, and they were also quite distant from uh, European institutions. My fear, what's great about the current situation is that we see that this European civil society is, is being built and consolidating itself. And there's signs of new political uh, movements, of which Volt is one. My fear about it and it's, is that um, it may do the opposite. It may be very good at being connected across borders and knowing how the European institutions works, but not sufficiently attentive to the social fracture that is uh, running throughout our societies, uh, whether they're rich or poor members of the European Union or on the peripheries, all of them have this deep uh, social fracture. 
Then thirdly, citizens assembly. I think the important point is that if we create uh, something called a permanent citizens assembly, it can't have the kind of bureaucratic characteristics of the other European institutions. It needs to resemble much more the coffee house of Marika or uh, places where civil society can come, can run events, there can be cultural and festive activities. Um, and it needs to maintain uh, an experimental ethos. The, the ethos of the way European things are done is, is, to my mind, a really crucial aspect of the whole affair. It's one of the answers to why European institutions can't communicate. They're dominated by a bureaucratic ethos. And we need to have a vibrant uh, civic ethos in, a, in any new uh, institution. I think that there's discussions to be had about uh, what's the best way of doing random selection, for example, for, for members. I'm not personally in favour of, for example, choosing uh, 500 people and they stay there for the whole year. I think you would have a mix of different kinds of um, groups who may, be, uh, who may be gathered together for different purposes. We could have a, uh, a, a week-long citizen assembly on migration, followed by two week long citizens assembly on uh, the environment with different groups of people. I think that not everything needs to be um, uh, as kind of representative deliberative space. It should also be a space where minority groups can come in and run their own kinds of stuff. So what I'm saying is um, not a bureaucratic space, which um, is too fixed in its ways, but an open and experimental space. That last phrase, that poses a big question about how such an experimental space could find its place in the formal decision-making of the European uh, Union. The, uh, there, I think there's, there's um, one thing the European Union is actually quite good at in comparison with member states is around uh, consultation and uh, expert, expert input into policymaking. The problems that it has is that typically the people who participate and are able to exploit those opportunities for consultation and expert input are corporate lobbies. Um, so, and what we need to do is to make sure that the citizens can enter into those spaces as well. And that's kind of the space that I think a citizens assembly would try to force itself into. Well, thank you. That sounds really, really exciting. And thanks, everybody, for a very stimulating session in which I think there were lots of new ideas. So I hope we'll all meet again at future citizens' discussions about the future of Europe. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mary.